is the 17th summer of collaboration between Chautauqua Institution and the David and Joan Lincoln family to explore contemporary problems in applied ethics. We remain deeply grateful to David, Joan, and Katie Lincoln for their involvement and commitment to Chautauqua. Our presenting sponsor this week is Wilmington Trust, an M&T bank company and one of the largest personal trust providers in the United States, specializing in regional banking, corporate client services, and wealth advisory services. We're very grateful for Wilmington Trust's investment in the 2013 program, and in particular this week on markets, morals, and the social contract. This morning's lecture is also supported by the Crawford N. and May Selstrom Barger Lectureship in Business and Economics and the Robert S. Barger Memorial Lectureship. Crawford Barger was a Chautauqua enthusiast who chaired the Chautauqua Fund Drive for Jamestown, supporting the institution during its time of financial struggle and reorganization. Mary May Selstrom Barger was a pianist who performed on the uh, amphitheater stage and taught piano at the institution. Robert S. Barger was the son of Crawford and May, who was a trustee of the institution and director of the Chautauqua Foundation. His lectureship was established by friends and family after his passing last year. So please join me in thanking the extended family and friends of Selstrom and Barger families, and also Wilmington Trust and the Lincoln family. Thank you. We can program weeks like this only with the support from generous individuals, families, foundations, and businesses. Founding president and general counsel of the Campaign Legal Center, Trevor Potter, joins us today. He is former chair of the Federal Election Commission, appointed by the first President Bush, a Teddy Roosevelt John McCain Republican. He served as general counsel to John McCain's 2008 uh, presidential campaign. The author of several books and manuals and leader in the political law practice at Captain Kaplan and Drysdale's Washington, D.C. office, Mr. Potter is a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and has testified before Congress on federal election proposals and campaign finance regulation. He was part of the team of lawyers who advised on the uh, McCain-Feingold law and has taught campaign finance law at the University of, of Virginia School of Law and Oxford University. The American Bar Association Journal has described Mr. Potter as hands down one of the top lawyers in the country on the delicate intersection of politics, law, and money. And this is why we invited him to speak to us today. Trevor Potter has also achieved great fame as counsel to Stephen Colbert's 501c4. As Mr. Colbert's super PAC lawyer, he has appeared frequently on the Colbert Report, or the Colbert Report. <laughs> Trevor Potter's lecture is titled, Money in Politics, After the 2012 Election, Where Do We Go From Here? Ladies and gentlemen, Chautauquans and Colbert Nation, please join me in, we in welcoming Trevor Potter and his partner, Dana Westring, back to Chautauqua. Thank you all. It's such a pleasure to be back here at Chautauqua. The first time uh, I came, I was invited to come and speak uh, with my friend Norm Ornstein at the American Enterprise Institute. And Norm said, come, come on up and we'll, we'll do a conversation together. Uh, so I got here late at night having flown in, having obviously heard of Chautauqua, but not having focused on the details. And I was all revved up, and so I walked around on a moonlit night, and the trees were rustling, and the architecture was speaking to me, and I thought, where am I? <laughs> I couldn't believe that such a place existed. Uh, maybe in Hollywood, but that was it. Uh, the next day we had a, a, a good time, and uh, I reluctantly flew back to Washington that afternoon, promising myself that I would get back. So uh, I have more than once. It's, it's always really special uh, to be here. 
The, the last time I was here and on this stage, uh, it was with uh, Norm Ornstein, and I sat in this big, comfortable, overstuffed chair over here, and he sat in an overstuffed chair over there, and he asked me questions. And I, I replied as best I could, thinking to myself, this is certainly as safe a way as possible uh, to make sure I didn't get out of control. So today, I'm glad they've taken the training wheels off. <laughs> there are no overstuffed chairs. I'll respond to your questions, but otherwise, uh, I'm more or less on my own. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, I'm always nervous when I'm introduced uh, as Stephen Colbert's lawyer and a participant in the Colbert Report, because I know what that means. It means you think I'm going to be funny. <laughs> and so I always remind my audience of what I was told by the Colbert staffer as I was just about to go through the curtain onto the stage, and the staffer who had been shepherding me through to my first appearance leaned in and said, just remember, He's the funny one. <laughs> so it, you'll just have to put with me and, and eat your spinach today and hope for uh, the funny one another time. Uh, after the elevated philosophical thoughts in this room of Michael Sandel and David Brooks the last two mornings, I'm afraid I'm going to lower the tone and be crass and talk about money and not just any money, but money in politics. The 2012 election was a watershed election in terms of the money spent, how it was spent, and where it came from. So this is a good time to take stock of where we are in the financing of our elections and where we are going. 2012 was the first presidential election since the Supreme Court's decision in Citizens United where the court held that corporations are people too, as Mitt Romney put it. Actually, what the court held is that corporations have the same First Amendment rights to spend money in elections as individuals, which is slightly different, but has the same legal effect. It was the first presidential election with super PACs, a creation of another court decision. Super PACs can accept unlimited money from individuals, corporations, and unions, and spend unlimited amounts for or against federal candidates, so long as they are independent of those candidates. 2012 was the first federal election in which hundreds of millions of dollars of secret money was spent on political advertising by nonprofit groups, the 501c tax exempts that do not have to publicly disclose their donors. Finally, it was the first presidential election since 1972 in which neither major party presidential candidate participated in the public funding system. So, many firsts. Let's start with the money. Well, we hope we're going to start with the money. Let me try another. So my clicker is not working. That's the problem with slides. Is there anyone who could give me a hand? We have the nice Chautauqua laptop, so it doesn't have the little button I know to push on my own. Try the space bar. Hey! That is why I like Chautauqua audiences. They know more than I do in so many ways. That's all right, space bar will work. I'll just use it. Thank you so much. So, $7 billion is what was spent in the last election. The Federal Election Commission reports that this much money was spent on all federal elections in the 2012 cycle. As you can see, it has gone up a bit. It reached $7 billion, which is a 337% increase in spending in 20 years since 1992. Spending has risen about 35% in each presidential election since 1992. 
Congressional spending has also gone up, usually by several hundred million dollars each election cycle. However, in 2010, the first congressional election since Citizens United and Super PACs, spending jumped dramatically by over a billion dollars from the year before. Spending in congressional elections is now more than double what it was in 2000. The average cost of house races has risen 75% in the last decade. The average cost of Senate races has doubled in the same time. Now, averages, of course, include uncontested and safe seats. The story told by contested races is even more dramatic. In just four years, the cost for the most expensive race in both House and Senate has doubled. We had a $29 million House seat in Florida and an $85 million Senate race in Massachusetts. What is driving these enormous increases in the cost of elections? Why do our elections cost so much more on a per-voter basis than any other democracy? There are many reasons, but one dwarfs the rest. The Supreme Court has declared that it is unconstitutional to limit campaign spending. After Richard Nixon's 1972 re-election campaign, and as a result of the huge sums it raised and spent and the Watergate scandal, Congress passed reform laws to limit the amount of spending in elections. Congress's theory was the simple one, that rising election costs create pressure for more fundraising and larger contributions, which had a corrupting effect on members of Congress and the President. In the landmark Buckley v. Vallejo decision, the Supreme Court in 1976 declared unconstitutional any limits on spending by party committees, candidates, independent spenders, and the use of a candidate's own personal funds. In Buckley, the Supreme Court said the government can only encourage candidates to voluntarily limit spending in return for public funding, which is what the presidential public funding system did from 1976 until last year. Otherwise, however, the Supreme Court held that the First Amendment does not allow legal limits on campaign spending. The court said the government may limit the size of contributions to candidates and parties to prevent corruption, but not the amount that may be spent. So the result of the Buckley decision was no overall limits on candidate expenditures, no limits on self-funding candidates, no limits on independent expenditures, but Congress may limit the amount of contributions directly to candidates. All right, that's where we were after Buckley. How did the court reach this constitutional conclusion? That is the First Amendment, the full text. That's what it says, but what does it mean? That is a question now debated for over 220 years. The First Amendment was written to protect citizens when they criticize the government. No more arrests for sedition against the crown or seizing of printing presses for attacks on the government. No abridging of the freedom of speech. So what is speech? Speaking, obviously. But is speech the same as spending money in elections? giving money to candidates, giving money in return for meetings with office holders, giving money for an agreement to take or not take some official action, like voting in Congress, corporations spending money to elect or defeat members of Congress, spending money in campaigns secretly. The answers to these questions are less obvious and have been at the center of legislative and court battles since the Buckley case in 1976. Congress outlawed corporate contributions to candidates and parties in 1907, 
over a century ago, after the scandal of huge Wall Street contributions to President Theodore Roosevelt's re-election in 1904, one robber baron is reported to have said, "We bought the SOB. He just didn't stay bought." <laughs> Theodore Roosevelt apparently decided. That being a commodity was not an honorable position for a president. After his re-election, he called on Congress to ban corporate contributions to candidates and parties, and establish public funding of presidential elections. Congress agreed to the ban on corporate money, but not to the public funding of presidential campaigns. The right of government to limit corporate expenditures in elections was upheld. By the U.S. Supreme Court in 1990, in the Austin v. Michigan Chamber of Commerce case, the majority opinion in Austin said that corporations had the potential to dominate political discourse and elections because of their vast wealth, that the wealth had been gained in the marketplace under the protection of favorable laws that carried with them both benefits and restrictions. And that consumers and shareholders had not provided the funds to corporations for the purposes of political speech. Again, in McConnell v. FEC in 2003, the Supreme Court upheld the prohibition on the spending of corporate money in federal elections, but in a close 5-4 vote. In 2010, the Supreme Court's interpretation of the First Amendment changed. Citizens United, decided by a 5-4 vote, overturned decades of precedent and the recent McConnell case. The change in the vote was because Justice Sandra Day O'Connor had retired and been replaced by Justice Alito, who voted the other way. Justice O'Connor, in addition to being a Chautauquan, had served as a Republican leader in the Arizona legislature. So she understood how legislatures work, and the potential for corruption in campaign contributions and spending. In Citizens United, the majority found corporations, for the first time, had the same First Amendment political rights as individuals. The court declared a constitutional right to unlimited corporate and union spending in all elections in the country. Federal, state, local, zoning commission, and dog catcher. The court said that the government could only regulate political spending to prevent corruption, and that so long as the spending was independent of candidates, there was no possibility of corruption. <laughs> The core holding of Citizens United. Was that all speakers must be afforded the same rights to communicate with voters? The majority opinion said the government cannot favor some speakers, individuals, over others, corporations. The only problem with that impressive-sounding First Amendment theory is that after Citizens United, the court, in another case, almost immediately demonstrated. That it didn't actually believe that was what the First Amendment required. The other case was called Blumen v. FEC, which you probably haven't heard of. A group of non-citizens with work permits who lived in New York filed suit, saying that the laws prohibiting them from spending money in U.S. elections were unconstitutional as well, because Citizens United said that the government cannot choose among political speakers. And thereby exclude some from speaking. They said, "We are taxpayers and U.S. residents, and we have jobs and a stake in what the government does. Some of us are Canadian, so we're barely foreign anyway." <laughs> in Blumen v. FEC, the D.C. Circuit ruled that it is in fact permissible for the government to prohibit certain sources of speech, such as foreign nationals. The court said that the ban on foreigners spending money in U.S. elections had a long tradition in law. The Supreme Court let this decision stand. So, where are we? 
Corporate money? Yes. Foreign money? No. What is the difference? What does this mean to the court's explanation in Citizens United that corporate political spending must be allowed because the government cannot choose among speakers and favors some but not others? Especially since there was a long tradition of limiting both corporate and foreign spending in U.S. elections before Citizens United. Well, it means that the government still can choose among speakers and favor some over others, but in an odd and troublesome reversal of constitutional doctrine, it is now the Supreme Court and not Congress that gets to decide the public policy question of which of these non-citizens and non-voters can spend money in elections and which cannot. All right, how did Citizens United affect the 2012 election? As we saw, there was a great deal more spending. Almost half of this increase was the result of new outside or so-called independent spending, which rose a billion dollars over the 2008 election. This chart shows you year by year that we started a decade ago having very little outside spending, $22 million, and we've ended up now with over a billion in these non-candidate, non-party expenditures. Two important developments drove that number. The first was Citizens United and the related creation of super PACs, federal political committees that can accept unlimited individual, corporate, and labor contributions and spend unlimited amounts in federal elections for independent advertising. The second development was the possibility of spending money in elections secretly without having to disclose where the money came from. Ever since the Watergate scandal, the law has required that the sources of funding for campaign advertising be disclosed until now. More than $300 million of what the press calls dark money, meaning money we don't know the sources of, was spent on TV ads from groups that do not disclose their donors. Again, as you can see, going back to 2000, we had almost no money spent by such groups. Then you hit 2008, some, 2012, a great deal more. This was not supposed to happen. As Justice Kennedy proclaimed in Citizens United, a campaign finance system that pairs corporate independent expenditures with effective disclosure has not existed until today. After Citizens United, corporations could spend money, we would know where it was coming from. All right, given all the secret money that followed, it is fair to ask, what was he smoking? <laughs> In his defense, he was reading the text of the law. The McCain-Feingold law requires that if someone runs an electioneering communication, a campaign ad, that they must disclose everyone who gave them more than $1,000. Second, he was apparently unaware that the Federal Election Commission had acted to gut this provision of the law just before Citizens United. That is the FEC, my former agency. One of the important results of the Watergate reforms created to enforce the election laws on an independent basis with three Republican and three Democratic commissioners and four votes required to take any official action. Today, it is reduced to yet another example of deep partisan and philosophical disagreement in Washington, usually deadlocked 3-3, with the Republican commissioners opposed to enforcing the campaign finance laws passed by Congress because they do not agree with them. In the instance of the McCain-Feingold disclosure requirement, though, the three Republican commissioners were able to pick up the vote of one Democratic commissioner who was concerned about the effect of the disclosure requirement on unions. The four commissioners 
changed the disclosure standard so that it now does not require the disclosure of funders of over a thousand dollars, as the law says, unless they gave for the purpose of funding campaign ads. The three Republicans then made it worse by declaring that this purpose test is not met unless a donor gives money to pay for a specific advertisement, which they never do. The effect of this gutting of the disclosure provision is that the Supreme Court decided Citizens United assuming that all the new corporate campaign spending would be disclosed, and much of it is not because corporations give funds to trade associations and other nonprofits that run their ads in their own names, names like Americans for a Better Country or Americans for a Better Tomorrow Tomorrow, <laughs> which then do not disclose their donors because they say none of the money was designated for specific ads. This secrecy suits corporations because then they do not face criticism from shareholders and customers about their political spending. But that is not how the court told us things would work. Justice Kennedy said, in fact, that shareholders will determine whether their corporation's political speech advances its interest in making profits, and citizens will see whether elected officials are in the pocket of so-called moneyed interests. Eight justices agreed with that section of the opinion. They agreed that the disclosure of the sources of funding for campaign spending deters corruption and provides important information to voters about the interests of those paying for the advertising. Unfortunately, as a result of the systemic failure of the FEC to enforce this law, one of the several realities of politics that the Supreme Court majority in Citizens United did not anticipate or understand, we do not now have the full disclosure that eight justices said was so important to public confidence and understanding. Congress could fix this problem by passing a new disclosure law. But it has been deadlocked on this issue too, with Republicans who believe they currently benefit more than Democrats from this anonymous funding by billionaires and corporations, refusing to require the disclosure that the Supreme Court has said we would have. In addition to not anticipating secret spending, the Citizens United decision had another collision with reality in 2012. The Supreme Court in Citizens United said that the spending by corporations and others would have to be independent of candidates and parties and therefore could not be corrupting. First, as you could tell from your laughter, I think we're on the same page on this, it is not clear why they thought there is no danger of corruption when vast amounts of money are spent independently to elect a candidate. Let's say that one individual or one corporation spent hundreds of millions of dollars to elect senators or a president. Wouldn't that office holder be grateful? Wouldn't that office holder's official actions be influenced? or at least appear to be influenced by what the benefactor wanted done? Isn't that corruption or the appearance of the corruption in the language of the Supreme Court in Buckley? But the current Supreme Court majority says no. So long as the spending, no matter how large, is actually independent of the candidate. And that gets us to the second problem. The court was simply wrong in thinking that all of this new spending would be independent, totally independent, wholly independent, truly independent of candidates and parties. Priorities USA, the Obama Super PAC, was run by two former White House aides, and the president authorized administration officials to help raise money 
for this independent PAC. Restore Our Future, the Romney Super PAC, was run by former operatives from Governor Romney's 2008 campaign. Governor Romney met with the Super PAC donors to thank them, and both the campaign and the Super PAC used some of the same consultants. Newt Gingrich met with his Super PAC's biggest donors, Las Vegas gaming mogul Sheldon Adelson and his wife, in a closed-door meeting in Las Vegas at the very time that Adelson was pumping over $30 million into the supposedly independent Super PAC, which was itself headed by Gingrich's former fundraiser. So, wholly independent turned out not to be very independent, at least as you or I would define the word. Super PAC ties like these to candidates make the donors confident that they are giving money with the candidate's knowledge and approval, and that the candidates will be appropriately grateful after the election. This is exactly what the court has previously said constitutes corruption or the appearance of corruption. Well, now that we've looked at how much money was being raised and spent on elections, it's time to look at where it is coming from. There's been a lot of talk about the 1% in recent years, so let's look at some numbers. The FEC publicly discloses the names of every American who contributes the minimum reportable amount of $200 to any candidate or political committee in a two-year cycle. These are not major donors, the heavy hitters. These are average Americans, people in this room, who are involved in the political funding process at the lowest recordable level. All right? What percentage of Americans do you think give at least $200 to a candidate or a political group? Any candidate or political group, you don't have to give it at once, you can give it in $50 increments over the internet. So what percentage do you think give that minimum amount in a two-year election cycle? Two, 20, 50. One-third of one percent. That's it. One-third of one percent of Americans actually participate at the minimal recordable level. So, here's another interesting number. Ninety percent of all Super PAC contributions last year came from just over 600 people. 163 people gave half of that. That is a small enough group of Americans to fit into one room. That is the 1% of the 1% of the 1%. <laughs> I recently spoke to a major Republican donor I had known through the McCain campaign. He has given and raised literally hundreds of thousands of dollars for Republican federal candidates over the years. He told me that he is worrying about what is happening with political fundraising. He said he feared it would soon be down to a couple of guys in a room. And his concern was that he would not be in that room. <laughs> so if even the very rich are feeling left out, by the super-rich, how is the rest of our democracy to feel? And these donors are not only unrepresentative of America in terms of their financial resources, but also of their gender. There was a slide up there that's disappeared, and what it says is that only 11% of the top 100 donors to super PACs were women. The rest were men. So, as you can see, we have a very tiny slice of Americans who are giving.
That is who members of Congress and presidential candidates spend their time with, on the phone, dialing for dollars, and in person at fundraising breakfasts, lunches, receptions, dinners, and resort events. So let's talk for a moment about how all this money is raised and the effect that fundraising effort has on our system of government, because the effort involved and the effect is significant. Now, up here is a number with President Obama's name next to it, and there is another number. In this case, President Reagan's smaller number is the winner, because that is the total number of fundraisers that each candidate attended in their re-election years. In 1984, President Reagan attended a grand total of nine political fundraisers, none of them for his own campaign because he was in the public funding system. In 2012, President Obama attended 222 fundraisers for his re-election campaign. And there are only 365 days in a year. Even if you double up, that is an enormous amount of presidential days. And most of them were in California and Las Vegas and Miami and Chicago and New York, not in Washington at work. This is because we now no longer have a functioning presidential public funding system. President Obama did not participate in 2008, and neither candidate did in 2012. I know it's hard to believe but congressional fundraising is worse. This wonderful slide is from a briefing given by the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee to newly elected members of Congress in December of 2012. Just think, they have arrived in Washington after a hard-fought campaign, spent giving endless speeches and calling strangers to ask for money, ready to buckle down and address all those national problems they talked about for months. And this is what they are told their life in Congress will be like. Of the 10 hours that the average congressperson will spend working in a day, a minimum of four hours is spent on something called call time. Call time is sitting in cubicles in the basement of the House Republican and Democratic Campaign Committee headquarters, dialing strangers, asking for money. Never mind the receptions, the dinners, and the breakfasts for fundraising. I recently asked a former member of Congress if they thought this estimate of four hours spent fundraising every day by new members was accurate. And they said, well, yes, for a safe seat much more if they had a close election. Fundraising is now the single most important task of incumbent members of Congress. It also affects what they do during those few hours when they are actually working rather than fundraising. Members seek to be on committees that regulate businesses, like the commerce and the banking committees, because that enables them to raise funds from corporate PACs and employees who are affected by the decisions of those committees. Put me on the banking committee, I'll go to New York, I'll raise money, I'll come back and I'll work on implementing bank reform. <laughs> Members of the House who became new committee chairs this year immediately saw a 74% increase in the money they were getting from industry PACs. The contributions from those corporate and trade association PACs to members of Congress has been increasing steadily, as you can see. Labor, not so much. These PACs almost never give to challengers. They wait until the candidates have been elected and are members, so as not to waste their money, or anger incumbents. One of the first things new members of Congress do is hold PAC fundraisers in Washington when they get there, whether they have campaign debt or not, so that PACs will have an opportunity to support them. 
What are we to make of all of this information? The huge amount of money being raised and spent in our elections, the tiny percentage of Americans it is coming from, and the way in which the constant fundraising distorts the priorities and working lives of members of Congress. Well, let's start with the fact that a huge percentage of all of this money is being spent on television advertising. <laughs> and this is not just any advertising. It is not cheery, eat our breakfast cereal, please, or buy our gleaming car advertisements. You've seen the political ads. They are negative attack ads, almost every one. Somebody must be violating the copyright on the music for Jaws, since that's what they're usually set to. Certainly if they are paid for by one of those allegedly independent outside groups, they are negative ads, because their political consultants have told them that negative ads are by far the most effective way to win elections. These ads set out to undermine confidence in the candidate you thought you liked. They introduce doubt. Maybe she really does like mass murderers. <laughs> or lives to vote for higher taxes. Or tossing the elderly out onto the streets. The goal is not to increase voter participation, but to suppress it. To sow doubts so that some percentage of the other candidate's supporters stay home on election day. It is also important to reflect on the motivation of those who fund these ads. Here again is what Justice Kennedy had to say in Citizens United. Now, I find the truth contained in this statement breathtaking. Justice Kennedy isn't suggesting that corporations will do what is best for the country or even what is best for their shareholders as citizens, but rather only what is in the profit-making interests of corporations. There is a reason for this. Justice Kennedy is not a Supreme Court justice for nothing. He knows his corporate law. Corporations legally exist only to make profits. That is their duty to their shareholders. That is the job of their board and officers, to maximize shareholder profits. They can be sued for failing to do that. And shareholders themselves have no say. Most of the time, they are not even informed how their corporations are spending their money. And in any case, U.S. corporate law states that such decisions belong to the board and officers of the corporation, not the shareholders. So when a corporation decides to enter politics, the only lawful reason for doing so, as Justice Kennedy acknowledges, is to support and oppose candidates in order to make more money. What that means, of course, is that from a corporate standpoint, it is not only permissible to seek to benefit the short-term profit interests of the corporation, regardless of the potential harm to the long-term interests of the country, but it is the duty of a corporation to do so. Spend money to preserve a tax preference or policy that benefits your corporation or harms your competitor? Oppose tax reform because it might increase your company's tax rate, even if reform would encourage general economic growth? Fight to keep the military buying an underperforming and unneeded weapons system? Or oppose the streamlining of military procurement to save costs? That is a corporation's duty under Justice Kennedy's theory, if it is going to spend money in elections. This is just the sort of regulatory capture and rent-seeking that conservatives are talking about when they say Washington has gotten too big and bloated. 
What they fail to see is that the current campaign finance system entrenches the status quo and makes change harder for everyone. Here is another breathtaking quote. I'm not a U.S. company, and I don't make decisions based on what's good for the U.S., said the president of ExxonMobil. Now, I will bet that Mr. Raymond is a patriotic American citizen in private life. But the point he is making is that as a corporate decision maker, his job is not to think about what is good for this country or its economy or its citizens. His job is to think about the short-term interests of his corporation. In his case, and many others, a multinational corporation with unknown shareholders around the world, a corporation whose shares are bought and sold on international stock exchanges, by mutual funds, and computer trading programs. There is nothing wrong with that. It is how modern finance and capitalism works. But it must raise the question whether we want such international behemoths deciding who will represent us in Washington and who will establish our country's policies. I have known plenty of corporate executives who did not agree personally with some of the candidates their corporation supported. However, they are not making those decisions as individuals, as citizens concerned about the country's future, as grandparents concerned about the world they will leave behind. Rather, as executives, they are concerned about the next profit announcement and what shareholders and investment advisors will think. Many of those interested in what is good for some other country, not ours, if they even think about it in terms greater than corporate profits. That may be fine for corporations and their shareholders, but is it fine for our democracy and the future of our country? That is the question that we, as individuals and as citizens, need to ask. Once we have asked that question, and understood what is happening to our system of government, then, and only then, will we have the will as a country to do something about it. This is a statement by newly elected Senator Chris Murphy from Connecticut, who went to Washington, spent a little time looking at it, and said, it's important for us to expose the ugliness of political fundraising. Almost everybody does it here, and if we don't talk about how bad the system is, then we're never going to change it. I would bet... I would bet that most members of Congress feel that way. They're just constrained by political realities, in many cases, not to actually be so honest. But once we have asked this question, and understood what is happening to our system of government, then we can do something about it. Let me close by telling you about a meeting I was in recently in Washington, where the head of a major nonpartisan foreign policy think tank was giving a briefing on the military and economic threats our country faces today. He covered everything from the various crises in the Middle East to our relations with China. When he was finished, he was asked by one of the people he was briefing, which of these many challenges constitute the greatest threat to the United States today? Oh, that's easy, he replied. Our current campaign finance system. His audience of foreign policy experts was surprised, but he said, I say that because everything I have mentioned as a foreign policy challenge can actually be dealt with by intelligent U.S. responses. 
But with our current campaign system, I have no faith we will get those responses. Members of Congress are spending half their time in Washington on the phone, he said, dialing for dollars or at fundraisers. And they are only in Washington two and a half days a week because at least the leadership has fundraising trips to take every weekend. He went on. They have no time to talk to each other about policy, and they barely know the members of the other party because they are in Washington so little. Policy ends up being made by junior staff, and we didn't elect them anyway. If we can fix our campaign finance system, he said, everything else is possible. I couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to experiment with a new way of asking questions today. You may still, and I imagine most of you will, give your questions to the ushers uh, and they will bring them to us. However, you can also, if you are tweeting, uh, send your questions by tweet to hashtag CHQ and we will see if that works for us here at Chautauqua. As I see, we've got a lot of handwritten questions up here, and we'll get to those uh, t in just a moment. And those of you who have um, things that you need to do next, please be quiet as you leave. Uh, the place is packed today, and we can hear you if you're talking. So, Trevor, I am overwhelmed by the enormity of what you're dealing with. Um, and I'm also confused, and there's another element that came on the forefront in the, in the spring. Um, I don't understand the 501c4 and the IRS and what's going on there. So you might, if you could explain that briefly and I'll get to the questions and, and uh, we will do that. Is, is Colbert's, did you worry about Colbert's super PAC? <laughs> First, promise me, please, I won't have to deal with the tweets, right? You'll do that? Right, I'll Thank deal you. with the tweets. <laughs> All right, so the 501c4 IRS situation. Um, it's actually pretty straightforward. When I was describing the non-disclosure, that is, in fact, spending through these nonprofit tax-exempt groups, the 501c4s, and their 501c6s and 7s, and a whole range of them. The point is, they take in money it's not taxed, and they're supposed to spend it, in the case of 501c4s, on what's called social welfare purposes. Um, what happened is that PACs and super PACs register with the FEC, and they report their donors. Um, when we created the Colbert uh, PAC, uh, in addition to a little crawl on the screen that thanked all his donors by name, there were FEC reports filed, and you could see who had given to the super PAC. Uh, after maybe a quarter of that, Colbert had me on, and he said, now, I don't seem to have any billionaires giving me millions of money. Why is that? And I said, well, because often billionaires would prefer to be anonymous. And he said, but I thought you had to disclose everything. I mean, I was just following the law. And I said, that's true, but if you had something called a 501c4, a nonprofit, it operates under a different set of rules governed by the IRS, and it does not have to disclose its donors to the IRS, and thanks to the FEC decision, it doesn't have to disclose its donors to the FEC unless they gave for the purpose of funding po specific political ads. That was what that whole section was about. So what's happened here is that groups discovered there was a premium on being a C4, this tax-exempt social welfare group, because you could give them money anonymously without any limits, 
it can spend the money for political ads, the same political ads that a super PAC or anyone else could run, but there's no disclosure of the donors publicly. So the result of that is that $300 million you saw on the slide of secret money. It is basically C4 money, C6s, which are trade associations. And the IRS was overwhelmed by new applications for 501c4s, and it does read the newspapers, so it noticed that a lot of the C4s it had given money to that had said they were not going to engage in any political activity at all, or only a small amount, were suddenly spending literally tens of millions of dollars on candidate TV ads in the election. So the IRS staff said, we'd better look into these C4s, we'd better figure out which ones are doing anything political and find out whether they really are tax-exempt social welfare groups or whether they should be registered as political committees, which would mean they would disclose their donors. That the whole thing is about disclosure and whether there is a way to spend money secretly in politics or not. Now, what the IRS staff clearly did wrong was to pick loaded political terms like Tea Party uh, as a way of identifying groups that they thought might be involved in politics. It has since come out that they did similar things to progressive groups uh, and that you had even groups that were involved uh, supporting the state of Israel selected for special scrutiny because the IRS thought some of those groups were engaging in primarily political activity. So the short answer is that the IRS staff did something wrong by identifying initially just one set of groups that sounded conservative and engaged in politics. But the longer answer is it's because they're really up against a wall here. They're being required to look at and approve organizations, many of which then go out and engage in huge amounts of political activity and shouldn't be C4s. And they're trying to figure out which is a real C4 and which is really a political committee. I think the answer there is, is at the end of the day, going to say the IRS is not the right entity to do this. Uh, we don't particularly want the tax collecting organization trying to figure out who is political and how political they are, that that's a job for maybe a better organized federal election commission. And the end of all that should be, I think, that you say C4s do social welfare. If you want to engage in politics, then do it the way Colbert did and create a PAC or a super PAC and do your political spending through that and not through your C4. There's no reason a C4 can't have a separate account that is publicly disclosed, and I think that would solve the issue that, that has come up at the IRS. From Twitter, why do you think self-funded campaigns, Meg Whitman, Linda McMahon, have not worked? I'm sorry, would you say that again? Why do you think self-funded campaigns uh, haven't worked? Oh, I think self-funded campaigns have. Um, there are many members of Congress who are elected uh, and were the primary funders of their campaigns. Uh, New York City residents here are well familiar with a mayor who is the primary funder of his campaign. So let me assume what the question really meant is, why don't they always work? And the answer is that it is true that the person who spends the most money does not always win. The odds are they usually do. They certainly win if the other candidate can't raise enough money to get their message out so that the voters are only hearing from one candidate. But the reality is that just because you have a lot of money does not mean you're a nice person, a genius, politically adept, and there are a series of examples of people with a lot of money who were also political idiots, or at least... Um, had a tin ear. So I think the reality is that after the Supreme Court's decision in, in Buckley that the government couldn't limit what candidates spend, that if you have a lot of money, you have a leg up, clearly, in politics. You have an introduction. The party campaign committees for the House and the Senate, when they're out looking for challengers, are always looking for self-funders because then they don't have to help them raise money. Then they know the candidate will clear the initial hurdle 
of having enough money to be heard. Now, if what the voters hear from the self-funding candidate is nonsense and unappealing, it won't work. But they, they have a, a leg up. Let me, let me finish that answer by saying that I had a conversation recently with a former member of Congress who ran, served for a bit, uh, then lost, and she said that her son was graduating from law school and interested in politics. And she said to her son, you know, if I were you, I would go out and make a lot of money first, <laughs> then run for office. Now, this came from someone who had been on the local town council and worked her way up from the bottom, but her point was, it's just so much easier if you can self-fund and write the check. You get over the initial hurdle, and then you can go and present yourself to voters. Of course, what I said to her in return was, yes, but you were a good candidate because you'd been at it for years. People knew you. Uh, they, you had learned how to do this. You're telling your son he should go to Wall Street, earn a lot of money, and then with perhaps no political skills at all, uh, try to enter the, the, the game. And that's not necessarily the, the easiest thing to do. We have some people who want to argue with you. Good. Um, they want to ask you about um, the level playing field with the unions. Um, this is this question. Employer, uh, employers still are obligated to give you, the unions the money that are collected from the employees, and then they use that to influence politicians and see that as a level playing field. Uh, there's one about the... Um, the scandals which are keeping conservative dollars out of the political process. It, you just explained how that worked, but again, is that a level playing field for Citizens United? Right. I, I, to be clear on keeping conservative dollars out, if you looked at those slides, um, conservative dollars are, are in there. Uh, what's, what tends to happen is, uh, at least in my experience in this world, uh, the Democrats start by doing something that's a little edgy. The Republicans then come in like gangbusters and do it multiple times what the Democrats were doing. And back in 2004, uh, there were groups supporting Senator Kerry when he was running for president, and they were C4s, and I think the Democrats were very uh, proud of themselves, thought they'd been clever in coming up with a new way to spend money in elections. Uh, this time around, the amount of money raised and spent by Republican and conservative groups uh, was four or five times uh, the amount that was spent by the uh, corollary Democratic groups. Uh, you know, that, that may balance itself out over time. I don't think there's any particular magic to one side or the other uh, on this. The, the union question uh, is, is a really good one because uh, you know, any time I talk with a Republican office holder, they say, and I will imitate a, a certain senior senator from Arizona. Whatever we do, it's got to be even. We've got to do something to make sure the unions are covered by this. And that's true. What people, I, there are a couple of things I think that are, that are maybe not generally understood. One is that all of this union spending actually is disclosed to the Department of Labor. They have a regulatory structure put in place in the 30s and 40s. Uh, that is really quite amazing in its extent. They report on an annual basis all the salaries they pay, the money they spend on politics, where all the dues goes. Now, that most people don't go to the Department of Labor website and look for it, but it's there, and the press and others can find out where that union spending is going. There is not any comparable reporting requirement on the corporate side. So the Chamber of Commerce does not report who its donors are, how they're spending their money, et cetera. In terms of the actual spending, uh, that one of the last slides I had that showed the amount of money spent by corporate and trade association PACs is much higher than the amount spent by unions. And the corporate money has been going up, the union money has been holding steady. Uh, that's not surprising. Union money comes from dues. Uh, they are not raising their dues a lot. They have, as a percentage of the economy, certainly, fewer members than they used to have, uh, so that when you line them up against the corporate side, union money is not growing. And corporate money uh, is, to some extent, you know, almost inexhaustible. There are lots and lots of corporations who are not currently participating in the political system who could. 
Now, having said all that, I think there is still a very real issue, which is what happens to union members who give their dues to a union and they don't want to support the candidate the unions are supporting. Uh, that's a fair question. I think it applies equally, though, to the corporations, where, as I've said, shareholders have no say in how corporations are going to spend their money either. So, to me, a requirement that said that any participant in the system, unions or corporations, should get the consent of the people whose money they're using would be a fair requirement. Unions don't like it because they're afraid they will have even less voice and raise less money. Uh, but I assure you, corporations don't like it either. Uh, they don't want to uh, go to their shareholders for, for that consent. So I, I think my summary of the union question is to say there was a time in this country when unions were vastly more powerful politically than they are now. Back under Roosevelt and Truman, unions basically could dictate who the Democratic nominee for president was, and they provided most of the funding for the Democratic National Committee. That is not the world we live in uh, today, uh, by a, a long shot. Several people think term limits might be an answer. What would you say to that? Um, I, I think changing the, the personalities is important. You don't want to end up in a situation where people uh, go to office and, and then think somehow they got put there by God and they have a right to stay there forever. Um, on the other hand, you know, I think we benefit from having experienced uh, office holders, people who have been there, understand how the system works, have stopped focusing so much on re-election and can focus on the policy before them is important. We've seen the experiment in, in states like California that have term limits, uh, and it, it moves people around, people in the House then run for the state Senate, and people in the state Senate run uh, statewide, so that juggling is good. Uh, I think my answer would be that what we've learned from the states is that it has its up and its downsides, uh, that you lose expertise. Uh, the ultimate term limit, of course, is that voters can vote someone out, that works better in a system where you don't have as much gerrymandering as we do now, meaning uh, the, the, the the line I like is that voters should be able to choose their representatives, not representatives choose their voters. And if you had a, a more even uh, map where more races, more congressional seats were competitive, then I think you'd be in a much better position to hold members accountable and have term limits at the ballot box. Today, you have entrenched incumbents who are never going to be unseated in the general election. The question is, are they going to have a challenge in the primary? Uh, and, and that's not how it ought to work. A lot of questions about what we can can do societally and individually. So I'm going to start with societally. There are questions about can we have some kind of, of um, pressure to overturn Citizens United? Are there lawsuits that are available? Are there ways that we can introduce an amendment to counteract it? What are some of the um, systemic ways we could address Citizens United if we wanted to. Well, let me start by putting in a completely shameless plug for the uh, nonprofit that I had in Washington that you mentioned in my introduction, the Campaign Legal Center at campaignlegalcenter.org. Uh, it's a small group of lawyers and it exists to deal with these issues. It is constantly filing briefs in court cases, uh, drafting legislation when asked by uh, state legislators and trying to make this work from a legal perspective. Uh, I am a skeptic uh, on the issue of a constitutional amendment for a couple reasons. One is that I think uh, it runs the risk of diverting all of the effort and attention that we need on this issue to that one potential solution, amending the Constitution. Uh, as you probably know, an amendment to the Constitution requires a two-thirds approval from each House of Congress. Well, do I need to say any more, given the current Congress? <laughs> it would then require the approval of three-fourths of the states, which would 
presume a national consensus on this issue that we don't have today. So for those who favor an amendment, I say, all right, but let's get it in the right order. Let's first get the national consensus that we have to do something, and then we can talk about uh, an amendment that's going to pass Congress and that's going to pass the states. The other problem with an amendment is it's not quite clear to me what it says. I've attended uh, day-long conferences where various law professors stood up and they each said, here's what, my, what the amendment ought to say and what the guy before me said and the guy after me is going to say is wrong. Um, mine's the only way. So I've listened to four or five of these. And basically, they're either incredibly broad and they say Congress can regulate money in elections. Period. That would do it, but then the question is, what, it, what power have you just given Congress? Does it include power over newspaper editorials? Um, that's money in elections. So you get a very broad answer that I think at the end of the day people will find is, is too broad. Or you get a kind of narrow answer that says they can reg Congress can regulate money spent by corporations, uh, but nothing in this shall be construed uh, to in any way affect First Amendment rights. And then you say, well, what does that mean? And the answer is the Supreme Court will have to tell us, and it's this Supreme Court. So it, there, the, the shorter way to do that would be to deal with Supreme Court appointments rather than amending the Constitution. That actually, I think, answers one of the questions that I just had in my hand um, about whether or not you think there would be a, and we, we've been playing what if quite a bit this, uh, this season, um, what if Citizens United came up today, do you think the ruling would be the same? Oh, I think the ruling absolutely would be the same. One of the great things about Chautauqua uh, is that it is an opportunity for people of different views on subjects to talk with each other. So those of you who are here next Monday, I'm told we'll have the privilege of talking with Justice Kennedy. Indeed. So you, you'll, you'll have a chance to ask him that. But I, I, yeah, I think it's pretty clear that the current five justices in the majority believe that Citizens United was correctly decided. I think they're surprised by the amount of hubbub. Um, they didn't expect it, I think, to be as controversial as it is. Uh, that has in some ways meant they have ducked other election law cases that have come along because they don't want to uh, stoke the fire. But, but I think those five would vote the way they did. The question, of course, and as I went through explaining that over time the Supreme Court has had different views on this, that it had a, I thought, great decision in Austin saying corporations are different for many reasons. Uh, that had... Uh, I think seven justices in it, six justices supporting that result. So it's going to depend on who the court, this is, is on the court at the time, this is not set in stone, and inevitably over time there, there will be different justices there. And are there things, I guess we'll end here, what we, we can do as citizens or as stockholders or as contributors, uh, what can individuals do? Uh, let me give you a, a small and a large answer to that. The, the sh smaller answer is that having heard so many people say, well, we need a constitutional amendment and we can't get one now, so there's nothing we can do, uh, I sat down and made the point that there is a lot that we could do if Congress was willing to by drafting something called the American Anti-Corruption Act. There's actually a website out there. Uh, American Anti-Corruption Act, if you Google it, it's about 10 things that I think are fully constitutional that even this Supreme Court would uphold and that would turn the system we have on its head. It would say members, for instance, actually have to work uh, eight hours a day, punch a time clock, and they can't go off and raise money. It would say that uh, members can't accept contributions uh, from entities, businesses, they regulate on their committee assignments. <laughs> that you would have to wait a longer period of time when leaving Congress to become a lobbyist. This, <laughs> this year, for the first time, we saw a spectacle I don't think we've ever seen in American history, which is a elected member of Congress resigned before getting sworn in for her new term because she got offered a better job as a lobbyist. 
It's true. So there are things that could be done. Look at the American Anti-Corruption Act. Uh, that's the small answer. The long answer is we have to push on this issue. I don't pretend I have all the answers, but I think it is clear we have a problem, and most anybody in the system will agree we have a problem, if they, even if they don't agree on what the solutions are. So you do need to be out in every walk of your life, whether it's talking to members of Congress, whether it's involved with civic groups, the League of Women Voters and others, uh, whether it is letters to the newspaper, uh, saying we need to do something. This isn't working. Let's talk about how to change it. I think it has to start with that sort of pressure on an individual basis before you can get to doing something. Good questions, folks. Trevor Potter, thank you.